Shall we bow our heads in just a word of prayer? Father, again we come in the precious name of Jesus, asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 35. And I want us to look a little bit at this man, Jacob. Uh, quite a colorful character. And I trust God will help us with it tonight. Genesis 35, beginning with verse 1. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make thee an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother, and then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise, and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods that were in their hand, and all their earrings with all which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were around about them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Well, may the Lord add his blessing. He went on there to Bethel and built an altar. And the 10th verse, and God reminded him once again that his name was not Jacob, but Israel. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. Sunday night, I think it was, Brother Rodney read something from Fenelon, and I, it uh, stuck with me. And I, wanted, I got it out, and I wrote it down here. I want to read it again. The more perfect we are, the more we get along with imperfection. I think that's great. And I rejoice. Now, not because I'm perfect, but because it tells me that God's perfect. <laughs> and if he's not upset with imperfection, it tells him he's not upset with me. That's the thing I rejoice. <laughs> well, that's what I'm rejoicing about. I'm glad he's not upset with me. And uh, he tells us to be perfect, wants us to be like him. And what it means, it, it means that he doesn't want you to be upset with anybody else. Come on, stick with me. Uh, uh, David Young's wife, I think it was Sunday, was it Sunday night when she testified and said, God loves us like we are. I believe something like that. I'm not sure. Now that's hard for us to get a hold of. That God loves us like we are. Sometimes we see God using people and we wonder how in the world he can use them. Think, brother, it's almost as if you think, Lord, do you know as much about this person as I know? Do you know what they're like? And he blesses them and uses them? It's because he's perfect and is not upset with what I see. Come on now. Stick with me. So it's hard for us to love those that we don't see how in the world God can love. A holy God loving imperfection. I was, uh, somebody was telling me about praying Hyde one time praying, and uh, I think it was him, and he was, he, there was a certain brother that he didn't think was what he ought to be, it was cold, and he started to tell God to tell God how about this brother, how cold he was, and he said he felt a hand go over his mouth. And God said to him, you don't know what I'm doing with them. So every man and woman that I see that's not what they ought to be, I don't know what God's doing with them. Now, God said to Jacob here, I want to go up to Bethel. And that's the place, Bethel is the place where Jacob first met God with the ladder coming down from heaven. My, what an experience. And I preached on that before, and God gave him that experience right after he lied and deceived his brother. Gave him this wonderful experience. 
And uh, he was to return to the place of his father in the 30, 13th verse, I think, of the 31st chapter. said, I am the God of Bethel, the place where you anointed the pillar and vowed a vow unto me. Now return to the land of thy kindred. And wh but when he got inside the border of Canaan, he stopped. He didn't go all the way. Now, I want you to notice here, God said to him, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there and put away the gods that are among you. Now, I want you to know that it took Jacob 30 years after his experience of seeing a ladder to heaven and God said he'd bless him. It took him 30 years to get to the place to clear his house out of idols. 30 years. It took him 10 years after he had his marvelous experience of wrestling with God and his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. It took him 10 years after that before he could say this. Now, what am I trying to tell us? All through those 30 years, God blessed him. I would like to think just a minute, what about Esau? Suppose, here, here's Esau, and you, you're, so let's just suppose you lived back there in that day, and you were with Esau, and uh, here God blesses this man with a ladder to heaven, and says, I'll bless you and go with you, and you go up to Esau and say, now Esau, don't get upset, your brother deceived you, he took away your birthright, he got your blessing, and he lied to your father, but don't you get upset now, because God's using him. How far do you think you'd get? What I'm trying to help us to see is we shouldn't get upset when we see God using people that we don't think he ought to use. You ought to enjoy everybody you see on a platform anywhere. I don't care what you know about them or see about them or heard about them or anything. You ought to enjoy them. You don't know what God's doing with them. Instead of sitting back and saying, well, brother, I tell you, I don't know how he got up there. I don't know how they can use him. Well, I wonder if they know all about this fellow. God knows all about him. God put him up there, and he, 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 look what he did. Look what he did with Jake. He blessed him for 30 years. All the time, right afterwards, and I tell you, you never could have told that to Esau. And yet God did it. Now, if he did it then, what's he telling you? He's telling us he still does the same thing today. He blesses people that you don't see how in the world he can bless, and he and not only that, he uses them. He uses them. Now, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that God wants us to look upon everybody and love them, whether what whatever what we see about them or know about them or anything else. You love them like they've already been Israel and God, because that's what God does. God looked down the line from that ladder to heaven and saw him 30 years later when he said to his house, all right, it's the time to arise and go to Bethel, get the idols out of here. God already knew that and saw him and blessed him like it had already happened. So God wants us to do the very same thing with everybody else. Now, the part of the difficulty is we don't know who's Esau and who's Jacob. I like something I read in the Divine Romance by, I'm not forgetting who the author was, Gene Edwards. And he was writing about two characters, <laughs> one bad and one good. And he said, the problem is we don't know which is which. He said, we don't know and God won't tell. <laughs> God doesn't tell us who's a Jacob and who's an Esau. He doesn't want you to know. He never told any of his disciples who Judas was. Well, you see what I'm driving at? I'm trying to help you to see that we need to love everybody. I don't care what you know about them, what they've been doing, or what they've done, or anything about it. You love them like they're already an Israel because God may be dealing with them, and you let God deal with them, and you love them like God loves them, and, in, and perfection loves them. Now, if we can do that, we can the love will truly reign in this church, and there'll be absolutely no un, or hard feelings about anybody over anything they've done or are, or even what they are. 
We don't know how God's dealing with them, and it may take them 30 years. And I'm not telling this for for you to take 30 years to get where God wants you. That isn't the point. I'm just trying to help us to see that God is merciful, and if it takes 30 years, all right, let it take 30 years. It shouldn't take us that long, and it's a shame that it took Jacob that long. But I'm glad God is merciful for us to put up with us like that as long as he does. So I'm thankful that God is the kind of a God that he is. But God saw Jacob what he was 30 years from now. God saw him as Israel, a prince with God, having favor with God and man. God saw that after he deceived his father and the latter went up to heaven and God said to that uh, rebellious uh, young man and uh, lying and whatever all, deceiving and so forth. And God spoke to him and God said, I'm going to bless this young man. Oh, that we could bless people in this manner and not set ourselves up as a judge as to what they've done, what they're not doing and what, where they ought to be and this fellow's not where he ought to be and he ought to be here and he or should, this one ought to be here, this one ought to be in prayer meeting, I don't know where he may be out the ball game, he shouldn't have been out there, he should be, we better leave all that go because I tell you, we don't know what God may do with him at the ball game. Do you know that God's able to speak to a person at a ball game? Do you know that God can speak there as well as in church? Yes, he can. He can speak there just as well as in church. And so God blessed him accordingly. I know that everyone, as I said, doesn't turn out to be uh, an an Israel, but uh, I'm thankful that God treats us the way he does. He said, put away our idols. An idol is anything, of course, that we put ahead of God. He's telling us to put it away, and it took Jacob 30 years. Because Rachel, you remember, brought the idol from her father's house and brought it right along with her and kept it, kept that idol in that home for 30 years until now. And this is the first time Jacob said, let's clear the house out of idols. The Berkeley translation said Jacob of Jacob told all under his authority, he said to get rid of the strange God, purify yourself. It says, be clean and change your clothes. Brother, he went all the way. The Berkeley translation says, let us move up to Bethel and I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and kept, com- kept me company on my journey. Put away the idols. And after his marvelous experience of wrestling with God and his name changed to Israel, you'd have thought, surely now this boy is going to go all the way. But he got inside of Canaan and stopped there at Shechem and built a wall. Well, I'm in Canaan, that's far enough. And built an altar there and God didn't turn there. He said, get up to Bethel. He stayed in Shechem 10 years until God had to drive him out with trouble. Isn't that something that so many times God has to drive us where he wants us? It's a shame that we move sometimes so slowly in all of this. Well, you know, what I'm trying to say to us, let's don't be hard on others. Let's don't be hard on others. Let's allow for their imperfections. Let's allow for their difficulties. Let's allow for their shortcomings. And take it that God who is perfect loves them and we're going to try to love them just like God loves them. Now I think of Rosalind Goforth, I don't know if you know Goforth of China, was a great missionary to China. He had revivals through China, great, really, Holy Ghost awakening revivals in China. Thousands, I think, were brought to Jesus. So marvelous. They had the Canadian missionaries. And his wife was a tremendous missionary, a marvelous missionary, but she had a bad temper. Nobody wanted to work for her. And she's a missionary. And God's using her. Bad temper and all, God's using her and did for years. Bad temper and all, God used her. And it never really dawned on her so much about it. And she overheard uh, two of the Chinese women saying one day, Mrs. Goforth is a nice woman, but she has such an awful temper. And nobody wanted to work for her. A Christian missionary. A great woman and was working hard for God and doing great work. And God was blessing her with that bad temper. He's blessing her. And uh, so finally one day came when she took a furlough and went to Canada. And she got into one of the, the, the I guess, I don't know, deep, deeper life meetings or something of that kind. She heard a speaker speak. And uh, he was preaching on this deeper life and deliverance 
from these things that hold us in bondage. And this thing of temper came to her. And finally the preacher, when he finished his message, said, Now how many of you here need this? Well, she said, Lord, I need that, but I'm a missionary. I don't want to have to raise my hand in front of all these people. But finally she got it up. And she got also, she got the experience. She got delivered after years of being on the mission field and being used of God in bad time. She finally got the victory. But God had used her all the time. She was trying to get it. Isn't that great? I think that's wonderful. So if you see somebody someplace lose their temper and they think they're a good Christian, that's all right. You bless them and pray for them and go right on because God probably, he loves them. He'll deal with them sometime. He'll get rid of it. He'll find the place to get rid of it. But you let him do it. So after she got delivered and this marvelous change came in her, when she went back to China, they said, what happened to Mrs. Goforth? For, for nobody wanted to work for her. Now everybody wants to work for her. Tremendous, marvelous change. But anyway, after the meeting was over, she went up to the preacher. You know what she said to him? She said, how is it that I've never heard a message like this before in my life? A missionary to China. I never heard this message. Do you know what he told her? He said, your husband has preached this message for 20 years and you never heard it until today. Is it any wonder that Brother Helm says not very many hearing me? Two or three heard me. She sat under her husband's own preaching and never heard it. Until this wonderful day that God finally gives the revelation. And that was probably a tremendous revelation to her. You've heard this message for 20 years and still you never heard it. What does that tell us? How much are we missing? At waitings on God and Brother Helm's ministry and Brother Oliver preaching, I wonder how much we're missing. We think we're hearing it. She thought she was hearing everything her husband preached, I suppose. But finally that day of revelation came and when she saw it, thank God she wanted to get rid of it and God delivered her. And just like Jacob, there came this marvelous day after 30 years of great deliverance, put the idols away, it's time to get them out of here now. And he was ready to go with God. Change your garments, let's be clean. We're going up to Bethel and we're going to build an altar. We're going to worship God and live like we ought to live. Thank God for that change. It's what God wants in us. But in the meantime, let's love each other and let's be careful with each other and let's don't, uh, let's uh, treat each other like God would treat us. Give God time to work. He's working. But in the meantime, let's love everybody.